Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Now unless you've been living under a rock the last few months, you might have realized or read at least that Bitcoin and the whole cryptocurrency market has pretty much exploded. Price gone bananas. Now unlike traditional assets like shares and properties and bonds, I think this whole new area, this whole new asset class remains a mystery, not just to us in Malaysia, but around the world as well. And I, like you, have a whole bunch of questions, including things like, who the hell is this Satoshi guy who wrote the white paper on Bitcoin in 2009? Why there are so many huge peaks and troughs in the price action of such uh, cryptocurrencies? And really, is the data on the blockchain as unimpeachable as its maximalists assert it is? And so to answer these questions, I sought out a gentleman named Aaron Tang. Now he's the regional head of the local crypto platform Luno, which I understand is the most established in Malaysia, as well as being among the first, if not the first, to be approved for operation in Malaysia by the Securities Commission. Now, as with most topics that intrigue and fascinate me, this turned out to be quite a long and detailed deep dive into this whole new world, which I think if the subject matter intrigues you as well, you hopefully will find as interesting as, as I did when conducting this interview. So as always, if you find my interviews useful, please do consider helping me grow this channel by subscribing to the channel, by liking it, uh, this video, and even perhaps even sharing it with your friends and leaving some comments in the box below. And so now, dear viewers, without further ado, may I present Aaron Tang of Luno, the global cryptocurrency platform. Aaron, um, I've been chasing you a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and it's quite opportune that we're doing this now because I think we're in the early throes of the crypto summer, right? The crypto bull run. And I'm quite glad that we managed to pull this off. Um, so let's start by you, I guess, just setting the stage and telling us where you are in terms of your title with Luno uh, for now. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for having me, Chuang. Yeah. Yeah, we, we should have done this a long time yeah, ago. But, right, uh, yeah. <laughs> so currently, I am the general manager for Luno in Asia Pacific. Uh, so I oversee all of Luno's operations in Asia and also Australia. So to clarify, Asia means uh, Malaysia? Malaysia, Indonesia and Australia right now. Malaysia, Indonesia, Australia. So you, you oversee the activities for the market within these three countries? Yes, correct. Okay. So give me um, the definition of a cryptocurrency because I think a lot of people still don't realize or don't understand what it is. Yeah. The challenge with cryptocurrencies is you can define it in a huge number of ways. But I think the easiest way to define it is to think about it as a digital asset. Yeah? Digital asset. Something asset meaning something valuable something that is usable for people and then digital in the sense that it lives 100 percent online lives 100 percent on the internet so i think if you view cryptocurrencies that way it starts to make a little bit more sense as opposed to uh, some other funky definitions okay there's a lot of attributes of cryptocurrencies as well um you can self-custody um, you can transact permissionless without the intervention of a central authority. Um, you've also got the whole issue of, of accuracy, right? There's no loss. It's basically on the blockchain. Right. So can you explain those attributes? Yeah. The, the term that gets thrown around a lot is uh, immutability. So immutability basically means once you write something onto the blockchain, then it exists there forever. Permanent record, right? So I think that has a lot of interesting applications. For example, if you want something written in history that cannot be tampered with, that's what a lot of the blockchain proponents will say, okay, cryptocurrencies are very cool because you will have a permanent record. So that's the immutable part. I think the other part that uh, a lot of people talk about is decentralization. So decentralization, basically the concept of uh, something that does not rely on just one central authority. So Typical central authorities, we are very used to, for example, uh, let's say the administrator of a system or maybe a, a government, a central body that manages everything. Whereas cryptocurrencies, in its purest form, they were meant to be decentralized, meaning that it is basically power to the people. People are contributing to the system together and together they maintain the, 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 the power of the system, the, the, the veracity of the system to make sure that there's no uh, fraud or there's no cheating or anything like that. So that's, I think, the other thing about cryptocurrency that gets thrown around a lot, decentralization. And then it's also self-custody, right? You can actually own, you can actually hold your, your coins, your tokens within your own wallet with your own set of uh, keys, as it were. So yes. that's another big appeal yeah. rather than have it held in, a, in, a, in an account with an institution, for example, bank, right? Yeah, correct, um, correct. 
what what are the attributes of that? Yeah, so <coughs> it, it's it's an extension of decentralization, right? Because if you look at a centralized system, it is what we call a permission system. In other words, that institution or that organization, it has to give you permission to hold an account, example. Uh, so for example, maybe a bank, you need to go through a certain process before you get a bank account, right? So that's a permission system. You would say it's a centralized system. In the decentralized system, because everything is decentralized, technically, as long as you, uh, as long as you uh, configure your wallet according to the the specifications of the system, you actually don't need somebody to hold it on behalf of you. So you technically can hold your Bitcoin, your digital assets in your private wallet, and that's the concept of private wallets. It's a uh, a lot of people say it's like, you know, I become self-sovereign because I actually control it myself. And it also has some uh, it has some advantages, for example, privacy and so on. Yeah, so that, I guess, is the appeal of why people have been migrating over from traditional finance to this new world of, of, of cryptocurrencies. What are those drivers? What are some of those drivers? I think, I mean, if, if we're being like 100% uh, realistic, practical, a lot of people are first attracted to cryptocurrencies, digital assets, because they look at it like, oh, this is a potential for me to not only store my wealth, but also to grow my wealth. Right, so I'm looking at it as an opportunity. Like, oh, okay, you know, a lot of people say I bought Bitcoin at X price, and now it has grown to uh, maybe two times, three times that. So I think that's the 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 first uh, angle that most people get attracted to: the opportunity for me to store my wealth and to grow my wealth. But what often happens is once people are in the ecosystem and then they realize a lot of these like very cool things like, you know, I'm able to self-custody, I'm able to become self-sovereign and so on. I think that's when they start to explore like the, the deeper nuances of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. And I think that's very cool to see. So I've always wondered what drives the price because the way you value a cryptocurrency is very different from how you value a stock yeah. or a bond, right? How, do, how and why do crypto assets move? So I think the important thing to remember, first of all, uh, and this this kind of trips up a lot of, I would say, people who are quite used to, say, valuing stocks or, you know, they look at discounted cash flows. Or, earnings or, yeah. and quarterlies and yeah, all that yeah. kind of look thing. Look at right? earnings and so on. <clears throat> I think the thing about crypto is because it's so new, nobody can actually come and tell you, oh, I have a 100% way that I can value cryptocurrency. I know how to predict the price and so on, right? Nobody can give you a comprehensive uh, value measurement of, of cryptocurrencies because it is so new, right? There are a lot of people who are, you know, writing papers about it, looking at what actually affects the price and so on. But if I were to, to boil it down right now, I would say a lot of it is driven by basically supply and demand. So basic economics, right? For example, um, in, the, in the case of Bitcoin, Bitcoin goes through a halving every four years. And a lot of people say that, okay, because the, the supply of Bitcoin decreases or rather the supply of new Bitcoin being issued decreases every four years, that actually creates uh, a lot less uh, supply in the market. And assuming that the demand should hold uh, steady or increase, then you'll start to see the, the price pick up. So again, there is no like comprehensive framework at the moment, but one other analogy way to, to, to kind of look at digital assets is try to imagine, um, you know, it's not a perfect way, but try to imagine that you are trying to value a tech stock right? Tech stocks may not be able to show you strong earnings and so on, but they, they have useful, uh, you know, what do you call it, attributes. You can look at adoption, how many people are actually using it. You can look at, um, uh, what do you call that, uh, sentiments like, you know, the usability of the network. What, what value is it driving to people that way? So again, these are imperfect metrics, but they can tell you a little bit about like how well a cryptocurrency or a digital asset is doing as well. And because Bitcoin is finite in nature, there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoins, right? And Indeed, I think the, yeah. the, the last bits, uh, the last one or two million only get done in 2034, right? And then that's it. You've only got 21 million of them. But that's not the case for, and that's why it's so appealing because it's like gold, it's finite, it's limited, and therefore that's what's so appealing. But then there's other cryptocurrencies as well which do not have a finite amount of, of, of coins on, on offer. They can keep issuing coins, right? right? Right. So that makes it a little bit more complex for people to understand. Yep, indeed. <clears throat> so I think, again, if we go back to Bitcoin, Chuang, like you said, I think that's why uh, a lot of people are very, very interested and attracted to Bitcoin because the concept of limited supply 
I think that's something a lot of people get. And the, the analogy is like digital goal, right? Goal is kind of limited. You you know that it's it's very scarce, very, uh, it's not easy to mine. And quite interestingly, the inflation rate of how much gold gets mined every year, I think it's about like one point something percent. And Bitcoin's current inflation rate is somewhat similar, slightly a bit higher. But after this halving, which happens in April, Bitcoin's issuance will actually drop below uh, the, the, the rate of which uh, gold is being mined. So I think people naturally latch onto that because the supply is, is somewhat fixed and dwindling. But as we mentioned, the other cryptocurrencies where the supply is not limited, where they can issue new uh, tokens and stuff, I think it gets a lot more complicated to try and figure out like what's the, what's the price value and so on. Yeah, and so when you are like an investor and you're trying to analyze this mm. market, because of the paucity of information and the complex and I guess non-traditional way that asset prices move, it makes it so much more complicated. So there's a lot of, um, I won't say confusion. I think I would say there's a lot of, a lot of disbelievers in the in the in the system now. A lot of people who don't understand it, uh, they poo poo it. They think that it's not for real. It doesn't have any longevity. How would you respond? I think. Um I think if we just look at the case of Bitcoin again, right? If you think about it, Bitcoin's only been around since 2009, right? Now we're here in 2024, so that's 15 years. And if you look at the the journey of Bitcoin, I would say it's nothing short of miraculous, right? Nothing short of miraculous because if you think about it, Bitcoin is just (coughs) lines of computer code that was uh, issued by, by somebody many, many years ago. And then it, it grew through a community of people who are like, oh, this is like a really cool tech invention, right? And over the years, more and more people adopted it. Um, and, you know, there were a lot of skeptics along the way. But today you can see that Bitcoin ETFs are trading on like the New York Stock Exchange and so on, right? So it has already reached basically the level of a mainstream asset, right? It's being traded billions, billions, hundreds of millions are being traded on a daily basis. So I think if we look at that, I would say that digital assets are basically inevitable, right? It's going to come, right? Today, you look at governments talking about, oh, we're going to uh, do central bank digital currencies. We're going to look at tokenization of real world assets. Uh, BlackRock is very, very bullish on digital assets and so on. So I would say that we have actually crossed uh, the we have actually crossed the point where people can't really like laugh and poo-poo anymore on digital assets. And and I think that's going to be true for not just Bitcoin, but also other digital assets on the way. Yeah, I mean, the S- the US SEC's um, approval of, I think, nine, was it nine or 11 uh, Bitcoin ETFs in January right. institutionalized this whole asset class, right? Mm-hmm. So now you've got people who didn't or didn't, couldn't have the ability to go and buy on the exchange themselves. Now they can just buy through their, you know, their 401ks in America. Then right. you've got all these advisors who, who used to sell them stocks and bonds or whatever. They're now offering ETFs, uh, uh, ETFs as well. Um, is that what is driving the current bull market? Where, where are we? What, what is this bull market thing we're talking about? Because everybody was like quite unanimous saying, mm. oh, the Bitcoin or the, the crypto bull market is going to come. And there was like a complete unison across the board saying, so... You know, in share markets, you can't foretell share market, you know, bull runs one, right? They yep. kind of like just gather ahead of steam like a tsunami and then it just goes to boom, right? But everybody seemed to foretell this this crypto bull market <laughs> without any exception. How is it possible? Like, can you just explain all that? Huh? <laughs> I, I, I think you might have been hanging out with like crypto believers, La Chong. Because <laughs> 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 I think a lot of people, uh, especially in the... I think when FTX blew up, right? I think a lot of people at that point, they said that, you know, crypto is done for, you know, write it off and so on. But of course, maybe, you know, in groups of like crypto believers and so on, like, you know, maybe you, me and our friends, we definitely believe that crypto's digital assets are here to stay, right? So if we if we go back to like um, Bitcoin's halving cycles. So Bitcoin so it follows yeah. the halving cycles. It <clears throat> is a theory. Now, I'm, I say, I, why I say it's a theory is because as we all know, right, you cannot predict future price based on historical trends, but right, but as we've seen in previous halvings every four years, um, typically we start to see like um, peaks or, or really, really high activity or really, really high price spikes in roughly about one year after the halvings, right? This has happened in the previous halvings. Now, again, we're not saying it will happen again, but it was like, like you said, a lot of people would say, oh, Bitcoin halvings happening in April 2024, 
So, you know, maybe in end 2024 or 2025, we're going to have another bull market, right? So a lot of people were saying that. But I think what was interesting is because of the ETF approvals that happened in January, and I think they launched in, in February this year, um, you actually started seeing a huge amount of institutional interest and institutional money flowing into the space. And as we mentioned, like, you know, if you see institutional buyers and then huge amounts of money, supply is somewhat limited. We know, we, we know the supply of Bitcoin is predictable. Then you can see the price starting to move. So again, it's not like we can predict, you know, what's going to happen after the halving and so on. But it appears in this cycle, especially, um, the amount of institutional interest has come in and really driven up the price. So so the thing is, I saw the price activity starting to move from about October onwards. I think in anticipation of the ETF approvals uh, sometime in, the, in 2024. So I think Bitcoin at one point in time was down to about 15, 16,000 or something. Yep. Yep. And I think Solana, in the wake of FTX's you know whole collapse, right, went to like think. So, so Solana's another crypto which I'm sure yes, you'll talk yes, about, right? Yes. So that went to like eight or ten bucks or something. And Solana's had this huge run now up now to like twenty times whatever it was. Yeah. It's nearly about two hundred bucks now, right? Yes. And Bitcoin is now something like like six, four times, or even maybe five yeah. times what yeah, it was, right? About four times, I think. Yeah. But now you're saying that that still hasn't happened. The 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 larger bull market hasn't really ro- happened yet, because maybe that early surge occurred with early believer money and then the institutional money happened in the first quarter of 2024 but the rest of the world who would normally FOMO in onto this thing hasn't come yet. Is it, so where are we on this crypto bull run? I'm, that's the real question I think. Yeah, it's it's again, it's a bit hard to, to predict these kind of things, right? But I would say that um, we haven't seen like mania. I mean, it's, it's quite haven't clear. haven't seen the mania from 21 yet. Yeah, right? yeah, we yeah. haven't seen any kind of mania like 2021. So, Give you a few few examples. Um, 2021, I think 2021, if not mistaken, crypto companies were all over Super Bowl ads and so on, right? So that was like... <laughs> yeah, Crypto.com, I, I think the whole stadium yeah, was named yeah, Crypto.com, yeah. right? Yeah, I, I mean like Matt Damon was on advertisements and so on, right? So I, I think back then, like everyone was talking about crypto. Um, if you look at 2024 right now, um, yes, more and more people are speaking about crypto, but I would say it is nowhere as crazy mania as as it was in in what we saw in 2021 yet yeah 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 because in in the in then the wake of november 2021 i think crypto winter set in yeah and then you know market pe- people use the term ptsd right post-trauma stress mm-hmm. disorder yeah then the whole thing just like collapsed by 80 percent and then like a lot of burnt fingers lah. you yeah. know that's why yeah. there's people you know there's a lot of disdain with the market so so that mania has do you think so what drives mania what what drives the whole market to fomo in again yeah, it's 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 a bit hard to predict, to, to be honest, John. Yeah, because you don't <clears> have that me. visibility like with sh- with stocks, right? You can yep. see trading volumes, you can see activity start spike, and it's very regulated, it's very transparent because it's an open market, there's a lot of price discovery. Yeah. But with crypto, there isn't. So I think on crypto exchanges, which are regulated, yeah. for example, ours, Luno, yeah. you can actually clearly see, because it's also transparent, right? Yeah. Uh, there's reporting and so on, there's, there's public order books. So you can see like... Uh, basically the amount of people trading and so on. So I'd say that transparency there is 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 definitely there in the regulated market. In the unregulated market, it's a, it's a bit harder to tell. Um, but I think the 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 trend that you, you cannot miss is that, I mean, if we, if we just step away from like mania and FOMO, right? Because that arguably is a bit, it's a bit dangerous. It's like. flighty, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. We don't, yeah. We don't want, technically, we don't want people to be in, in mania and FOMO because we would rather people take an investor approach yeah. to investing. And if you look at that, then you can see clearly that uh, despite the, the the peaks and the valleys, the price dips and so on, you can see that there is continued acceptance of digital assets. And yeah. you can see this across not just institutions like BlackRock, not just governments. Uh, you can also see it in um, even financial institutions. Even people who were very, very against digital assets, crypto, now they're like, oh, okay, maybe we should consider offering some version to our clients and so on. So I think that is what we would like to focus on, actually. Well, I mean, the basic question is, in 10 years or even 5 years' time, are we going to have a more digital future or a less digital yeah. future? And yeah. it's a simple answer, right? Simple it's answer. It's clearly a yeah. more digital future. Yeah. And if you look at the last, what, 15 years, right, Bitcoin has just basically blitzed every other asset class in terms of return. So um, I think that's quite unequivocal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, I've got a few assumptions to try and clarify here, right? 
The assumption, for example, is this whole blockchain immutability, right? Yeah. Validators and proof of work and all that, right? Who who are validating these transactions? Why is it so immutable? Uh, is it human beings? Is it just these miners? Val- so what are these validators? What is, what is this immutability? Yeah. And why is it so so like a hundred percent certain? Yeah. Let's look at the example of Bitcoin because I think Bitcoin is the easiest example. So the people validating transactions are basically miners. So they're people or they are actually people? They are Humans, computers. Right? They are computers. <laughs> yeah. And and the way that they validate transactions is basically mathematical proof. So basically a, a bunch of transactions go into a block and then the computers need to, to prove that, okay, these transactions are valid and so on. And if these validators are basically being dishonest, let's say for some reason they want to validate a fake transaction or so on, they would be economically punished in the sense that they would be the only ones like trying to say that this is correct and everyone else would uh, say that, hey, no, 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 actually this is wrong. And then uh, basically people would say, oh, you are a dishonest miner, right? And when you're a dishonest miner, maybe the, the network as a collective would say that, okay, you're actually not in the best interest of this community and you, you, you know you probably shouldn't be here. And it's also that you would actually be it would be actually very expensive to try and uh, basically uh, validate dishonest transactions because it's actually more beneficial if you actually contribute towards the network in a proper way. Then you would actually get some mining rewards and so on. So I think the, the, maybe the, 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 the summary of that is that the miners are all computers, but they're working based on mathematical proof and it's actually economically disadvantaged for someone to try and like cheat the system and so on. So because of that, that's how you, you actually build a very strong network because it actually benefits everyone if they're working for the, the benefit of the system. So these mathematical equations were actually set in, sp- in place by Satoshi in 2009 in the white paper. Is this how the code is written? So the code originally written by Satoshi 2009, but of course there's a core group of developers who continuously improve and look at the code. And it's all open source, right? I think the other thing to mention is it's open source, meaning that anyone, you or me, could look at the code. And if we find that something funny, dishonest or what, we can actually point it out, viral it on Twitter, Facebook. And basically the, the whole world would know, oh, there's something wrong with the, the Bitcoin network. Uh, however, as Bitcoin has run on for like 15 years, um, people have continuously evaluated it. The, the open source code is working as intended, it's working well. The infrastructure of Bitcoin itself has never had an incident where, you know, the the infrastructure was hacked or, you know, somebody lost funds because Satoshi wrote a, a wrong piece of code or something like that. So it has actually withstood the test of time. And this is how we know that the, the blockchain is actually very robust. And because we know of all the eyes, all the attention on it, we, we can have confidence that it'll continue to be robust. So although Bitcoin is the big dog, right? There's like thousands of other coins yeah. and tokens on in the in the universe, right? Mm. So what are the differences? So is is every other token ha- possessing its its own set of validators as well? Yeah. Its own set of code. Yeah. And are they as robust as Bitcoin? My assumption is no. Correct. Yeah. So I think I have to be very careful when I say this. Um, is are the other cryptos as robust as Bitcoin? Probably not, because Bitcoin has been around the longest. It has the most attention. Everyone's looking at it. It has the most miners and so on, right? Are they? Are there other cryptocurrencies, other blockchains that are robust? Definitely also, right? Because they may not be as robust as Bitcoin, but they're also battle-tested. They've also been around for many years. So I think the thing about each blockchain is they're all technological innovations. So somebody comes up with a new blockchain and they say that, oh, this blockchain is better suited for, I don't know, just simple example. They said this blockchain is very suited for AI processing, for example. Or another person may say, oh, this blockchain is very suitable for gaming. I'm going to focus on gaming. And then some people say, oh, my blockchain is very focused on uh, remittance. It makes remittance uh, very cheap. So I think people have come up with a lot of technological innovation. They may be different from Bitcoin in terms of how they do it, but I think that's the beauty. Lah. You know, everyone's coming up with a lot of innovation and, and just bringing more and more uh, cool things into this world. Yeah, and then of course, for people who are new to the whole uh, system, they don't, they're don't they not aware that there's transaction fees, what they call gas fees in the crypto yep. world, right? Yep. And gas fees differ from 
token and token. So the Bitcoin gas fee, very different from the Ether gas fees, very different from the Sol gas fees. Can yep. you explain gas fees? So gas fees is a concept, I would say it originated from the Ethereum world. So basically when you do a transaction on Ethereum, the simplest example of a transaction is sending crypto from one wallet to another. It will incur some level of uh, fees. And Why? It, Why do they incur these fees? Yeah. How do these, what are these fees to pay for? Yeah. So these fees are actually to pay for the miners, the people who are actually validating the transactions. Remember how we said that economically, it is advantageous for them to work for the benefit of the system. So basically, they are getting paid every time I make a transaction. Let's say I send, um, let's say I send ten dollars to you, or I send hundred dollars to you via crypto. The miners, the the people on the blockchain who are validating this transaction, they get a cut of it, right? So they get a fee. So that's the concept of gas fees. Now. Different different blockchains will will use different terminology. So I think in in Bitcoin we we typically call it a transaction fee, not so much a gas fee, but it's also basically to reward the miners. Uh, and in other blockchains, for example, Solana or Cardano or so on, you can also send crypto to people, and the the miners or the the stakers will get a small fee for for basically their trouble and their uh, not their trouble for their efforts in in in, in mining. But the, then again, it's very different. So ether fees are very, or, or rather, g- gas fees on Ethereum are notoriously expensive, correct? Right. Yeah. A- and 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 gas fees on Solana is, are notoriously cheap, for example, right? Yep. yep. So why is it that one token to another it can incur very different, very different uh, co- costs? Yeah. I think it all depends on how <clears throat> the the process of validating transactions happens. So, for example. Ethereum uses what we call a proof of stake. So uh, Solana uses something called proof of history. Um, so slightly, slightly different kind of uh, technological way to, to, mine, uh, to, to validate the transactions. So because of that, um, there's always a bit of a trade-off. Lah. Like the, the transaction fees may be high, but uh, Ethereum proponents will tell you that it is high because the network is very, very secure. There's a lot of validators and so on, right? Uh, same for Bitcoin. Bitcoin will say uh, our transaction fees are high because you know there's a lot of miners to pay for and so on. So again, there's some different trade-offs to pay when it comes to in terms of transaction fees. But I will say in terms of Ethereum, um, the fees are high on the main chain, which is why they have technological innovation on what they call the the layer two chains. Okay, for example, we're gonna talk about layer yeah. two. Sorry. <laughs> layer two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So like Polygon, uh, Optimism, Arbitrum, and so on. The fees there are, are much, much cheaper than on the main chain. So again, different, different blockchain, different style, different trade-offs and so on. Okay. So transaction fees, aka gas fees, yep. they also drive the underlying price of the cryptocurrency. So the more transactions, the more activity on the network, the higher the price goes because the utility of those networks are actually uh, reflected in the use of Ethereum, for example. So the more Ethereum you have transactions on, the more gas fees... It therefore drives the price of Ethereum. What is that? So my, my question is, what is the biggest driver of, of, of cryptocurrency prices? I wouldn't say it's a direct uh, correlation. So something that you mentioned, right, Chong, uh, like, okay, gas fees. If you look at it, if you take the analogy, gas fees is basically somewhat like earnings, right? Yes, right, correct, right. correct. Gas fees so, is somewhat so, so, like earnings, it, right? So in my traditional finance so world, it's, it's like it's it, earnings, right? It's yeah. clicking, right? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of people have have done studies like, oh, gas fees. If gas fees analogical, analogous to earnings, yeah. then if we look at the price, then we can start doing ty- things right. like PE ratios and, and stuff like that, right? Yeah, yeah. But I won't say it's a direct one to one correlation. I I think gas fees will tell you how popular a, a, a crypto blockchain is being used, you know, how much the miners are earning and so on, right? But as we know, it may not directly correlate to like stock price. Like for example, Tesla may make X amount of earnings, but its price may be 30, 40, 50 times because of also people say, oh, but I'm not just looking at earnings today. I'm betting on Elon Musk. Five, 10 years in the future, he's going to do something crazy. So again, it's not a direct one-to-one correlation. But I would say it is one of the factors that people look at how to value. It's like, you know, gas fees and basically earnings. So from the uh, price perspective, yeah. Ether right now trades at 3500 bucks. It hasn't yeah. really moved at all, right? It hasn't really caught fire. Whereas, Well, so- well I, I think it's actually beat Bitcoin this year in terms of pure performance. This year, year to performance? date. Performance? 
Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm pretty oh. sure that Ether has has beat Bitcoin okay. this year. Yeah. Okay, I'm, 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 so year today is since January <laughs> yeah, yeah, 2020. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know, but had, yeah. so 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 Bitcoin has really surpassed its all-time high. It's yeah. come off a little bit, right? Yes. Ethereum's all-time high is something like five thousand US dollars. Yes. It yes. hasn't come near. It hasn't come right? near. Yeah. Correct. So why hasn't Ethereum moved as fast? Is it because of the gas fees and transactions? Is it because it hasn't evolved as fast? And Solana, which is like the Ethereum part two, right, or like the Ethereum beta, Competitor, has just gone yeah. bananas, right? Yeah. 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 yeah but so I can mean, you explain those things? Yeah, I mean that being said, I don't think Solana has also reached its all-time high yet. I think it's uh, all-time high was two hundred sixty. I think. I think roughly, yeah. and yeah, it's about yeah. two hundred now. Yeah, give it. So, so I better get this interview out because <laughs> <laughs> the price can move right yeah. past that. So I think the, if I'm not mistaken, well, if we look at macro, most of the big coins, I think only Bitcoin has actually breached its all-time highs because uh, of the ETFs. The assumption is, right? Assumption, yeah, okay. assumption. Uh, and, and a lot of institutional money flowing in. I think most of the other coins have not yet reached their all-time highs, right? So, um, again, it's, it's a bit hard to say, oh, exactly why and so on. But I think typically we've seen in the past, um, usually it is Bitcoin that typically moves first, right? Bitcoin typically moves first and then usually some of the gains flow into some of the other cryptocurrencies and so on. So again, maybe this is, if we are following exactly historical trends, then maybe it has not yet reached the time for Ethereum or Solana in terms of interest from both institutional and retail for, for, for them to, to move yet. Yeah. Okay, so in I, I guess just to distinguish the different current cryptocurrencies, right? Yeah. Let's just stay to the top 10, for example, right? So top 10, you've got people like... Um, you know the Binance coin. You've got things like Solana and mm-hmm. Cardano, yeah. and and so to the to the novice crypto investor, what is the difference between Solana and Ethereum and Cardano? Is it because of the applications they're designed to do, right? Yeah, I think the easiest way to always look at it is what is this blockchain used for? So it's the utility, like the yeah. project yeah. utility. What is the blockchain used for? I mean, if you look at Bitcoin, Bitcoin was designed mostly as a, a pe- back in those days people say bitcoin is actually electronic cash peer to peer electronic cash but over time it has actually evolved right people look at bitcoin today basically as a store of value right they want to store their their value in it uh, and i think that's true for bitcoin etfs people are, institutions are buying in because you know i want to i want capital gains and so on ethereum was built to be they call it like a general purpose uh, kind of computer online which actually allows you to program multiple things on it so for example i could develop an app completely on ethereum but it is native to the crypto world meaning i i collect my fees in terms of crypto and we see a lot of innovations on the ethereum blockchain for example uh, we see what we call decentralized exchanges so people are able to trade completely in a decentralized manner and then we started to see other, uh, they call it layer ones, other competing layer ones. So basically people who wanted to do what Ethereum was doing, but maybe in, with cheaper fees, faster transaction speed. So that would be something like Solana and Cardano and so on. And then if we go further out of the top 10, then oh, in the top 10 itself, then you'll see a lot of stable coins. So basically people wanted exposure to US dollar, mainly US dollar. And then they wanted a tokenized version of that. So they started trading a lot of USD-related uh, stablecoins. So I think that would be mostly the top 10 today, which is basically store of value, uh, general purpose smart contract platforms like Ethereum, Solana, and then uh, probably stablecoins. And then I think probably XRP is there as well, which is basically XRP was designed for faster and smoother remittance between countries. So I think these are the, the, the major differences between the ca- coins. Yeah, so those stable coins would be like USDC, USDT, yes. XRP, things like the Litecoin as well, right? Um, well, <clears throat> USDC and USDT would be, be stable coins. Yeah. Litecoin, I think more like uh, lighter version of Bitcoin. XRP more for remittance, basically. Gosh, I've got so many questions. <laughs> um, so a lot of people also don't realize that that there are different ecosystems and sometimes they don't talk to each other, right? Yes. So yes. if you want to send Bitcoin to a Solana wallet, you cannot. Or maybe you can. I'm not so sure. You, so you got yeah. to go to, to another third party yes. before you can then send to that wallet. Yes, so, indeed. And if you're not aware of that, yes. and if you send your coins in that manner, you can lose your coins, correct? Indeed. indeed. Correct, yeah. Yes. So I, I actually made that mistake. Uh, oh, no. Yeah, but luckily FTX refunded me. So wow. I, yeah, I made those. So in this new world, unless you you know what you're doing, 
you don't know what you're doing and you can lose your coins as a result. And then there's also like tokens or whatever, some kind of password that you have to use. And so where do you go to demystify all these things? Because <laughs> unless you know, yeah. you won't know. <laughs> I, I'm going to say a very self-serving comment, right? Yeah. Uh, so if you go to a platform like Luno, <laughs> we try to make it as simple. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, Luno. If you try to make it as, as simple and easy as possible. And I agree that a lot of what you have said is like super, super huge challenges because... Yeah. For so, a, yeah, so yeah. the decentralized nature <laughs> yeah. is it might be decentralized, yeah. but it's littered with pitfalls and and potential to lose your coins. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of people sometimes ask me, you you as an individual, you believe so much in like self sovereignty and decentralization. Then why do you work with a centralized institution? Like Luno is a centralized institution, right? Basically, we are a company. We have a CEO. We have you know board of directors. Uh, we have hierarchy. So we are a centralized entity, but we work in the what decentralized. They a what they call a sex, right? A centralized exchange. Yeah, yeah, is yeah. Is that right? Yeah, yeah centralized yeah. exchange. Yeah. But we work in the decentralized world. So people ask me like, why? Why do you do that? And the answer to that is, I would say by large, most people in this world today are not ready to use the decentralized world mm. as it stands because it is incredibly, it can be incredibly confusing if you don't have a tech background, if you're not a programmer, if you're not a tech guy and so on. So I would say companies like us, we occupy a place in the ecosystem where we actually help to simplify things a lot. So for example, if, if you use uh, Luno today and you say you want to send your Bitcoin to uh, a Solana address, right? you put a Solana address when you try to send Bitcoin, Luno will tell you, hey, this address doesn't look right. It's not a Bitcoin format address. So, so you, it will quite, quite yeah, simply yeah. tell you. La. Yes, okay. yes, yes. So again... Um, Companies like Luno and other centralized exchanges are basically there to help people onboard into the system, into this like ecosystem. Um, and I think it's quite useful because you you sort of like can start at the centralized exchanges, and if if they are like hundred percent comfortable for you, then you can always remain there, right? But if you want like something a little bit more exotic, a little bit more decentralized. Centralized exchanges are more often than not the, the gateway, right? We, we help you get started on your journey and then you, you, you can learn from the decentralized world as well. Yeah, so some people who start in, the, in what they call the DEX, right, which is the decentralized yep. exchange, um, you don't have these warnings. So you can actually send erroneously mm. to a non-conforming wallet and they won't tell you that it's a non-conforming wallet and you can just lose your coins. Is yep. that right? Yep. I, I would say that you know, as the ecosystem matures and so on, yes, it will get better. Yeah, it right? will get better. Uh -huh. But yeah. you still have these kind of mistakes happening. So, again, I, I would say that, you know, for anyone watching, right, um, in the crypto space, because it's so new, right, I would say that there's actually no need to rush, right? There's no need to FOMO, right? Take it one step at a time, learn as you go along. And I think um, it's, it's actually quite a amazingly interesting space to, it's to be in. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, it's fascinating. Hugely fascinating. fascinating. It's got me hooked right up to the gills, right? <laughs> so the thing is, one of the other assumptions or one of the other benefits of crypto is that you can self-custody, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the, and in fact, they compel you or they, they basically recommend to you that you should not hold your coins on the exchange. Hot, right? Hot on the exchange. You should keep it on your own wallet, a cold wallet, which is not connected to the internet and therefore those coins are always with you in your pocket and it's safe. I have a I have a question about that because if you keep it on a cold wallet, yep. whatever the, some of those cold, cold wallet brands are, right? Yep. How does a cold wallet work? Why is it secure? And if you lose your coins, who do you talk to? Because like, for example, Kayla, I know you, yep. Aaron Tang, we've been doing Aaron. <laughs> if I lose my coins in your exchange, I say, hey, Aaron, wow. where my coins go? Huh? You can help me do a little thing, right? Yes. If it's on a cold wallet and I buy it from the US, for example, through Amazon yep. or whatever, right? Yep. Who the hell do I call? I've got no, I don't know. Yeah. And in fact, just last night, I was at a dinner party with my friend. He, he's, he's in Singapore. He lost all his ether on, on Binance. And he couldn't call anybody. He had no one to call, right? And I think Binance is unregulated in Malaysia. Yes, In Singapore, I'm not Malaysia. so sure. But he had a hell of a time about reaching customer service. Yeah. So what about this whole yeah. wallet thing, right? How does it work? Yeah, so something that we spoke a, a little bit about, the, the self-sovereign thing, right? Yeah. So if you use a call wallet, basically you're basically in charge of, of your crypto coins now. Now, the, the, the coal wallet itself, it's not that the coins actually go inside that coal wallet, right? The, oh. the, the coins are online, right? But what actually that coal wallet does is actually it stores your private key very securely. Your private key is basically, analogy is like, 
it's your key to unlock the coins that are on the blockchain, right? So they remain on the blockchain. They don't correct. actually try, They don't actually move into your wallet. <laughs> correct, correct, correct. Oh, okay. So they're all they're all in the blockchain online somewhere, right? The only difference is your private key holds the signature, the, the key to unlock the, 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 the coin. So if you wanted to use your coins online, uh, the, the crypto assets you own, you need the private key to unlock those. So yeah? in theory, somebody can still go into the cloud, whatever, into the thing, and take your coins from you. Can uh, they do that? It would be virtually, virtually infeasible, right? I won't say impossible, but very, very highly, highly unlikely because of the way that uh, blockchain, cryptography, security work. Only your private key can unlock your coins. So as long as nobody has access to your private key, nobody should, nobody would be able to unlock your coins to use online. So the, the thing about that private wallet that you hold, um, if you're going to self-custody it, you better have to have very strong operational security in the sense that you need to have that cold wallet backed up. Like, you know, if, if for example, the cold wallet gets stolen or burned or something, you need to have a backup way of retrieving your keys and basically, by extension, retrieving your, your, your coins online. So that's, I think, the difference between uh, self-custody versus custodying with a wallet or exchange like Luno. In a sense that when you custody with a, a wallet like Luno, then Luno is the one that is responsible to keep your private key or to keep your crypto assets. So if you lose your password or, for example, so on, you can actually send us an email, chat message, and somebody will call you and, and go through the process of retrieving your password and so on. So, so for example, for people who hold... Okay, let's talk about... Let's, yep. talk, let's keep it up for later, right? So, for example, if you want to self-custody yep. and you are a serious investor in the yep. crypto world, yes. you know, okay, like, let's just say Michael Saylor, for example, mm, right? Yes. Michael Strategy, he's got billions of... Right? How, does he, how do people who are serious investors in the crypto world... Yep responsibly and safely keep yeah. the assets? Are they all in multiple safe wallets? What is the um, the, the whole process of, of keeping it un under your own custody? So when what is you're, the professional yeah. way of doing it? So when you're at Michael Saylor's level, micro strategy level, you got, I think, billions of yeah. Bitcoin, right? Billions worth. You would most likely use a qualified custodian. So these okay. are companies that are licensed or very, very capable of being custodians of crypto assets. Now, again, it, it comes to the debate around decentralization mm -hmm. and centralization because people will say, hey, if you use a custodian, technically a custodian also a centralized entity, also got a board of directors and so on, right? Uh, but I think at that level, you talking about billions of billions of dollars, public listed company, there's no way you're going to like hold it on a cold storage wallet. You have to use correct. a custodian, yes. Okay, so if you, I mean, of course, if you're a semi-serious investor, right, yep. you've got maybe a few hundred thousand mm. worth of yep. assets, right? Yeah. Um, what is the process? What is the suggestion? Yeah. You know? So I would say a lot of people would tend to use a mix of uh, storage solutions. So for example, some of it, they may park at a regulated exchange like ours because uh, they trust in our security and so on. And then some of it, they may actually split off into their own uh, cold wallet. And some of it, they may park at, say, uh, another... Uh, I, I would say qualified custodians in Malaysia are not really here yet. But the SC, the Securities Commission, has actually issued two licenses for digital asset custodians in Malaysia here already today. So there may come a day where, you know, uh, people will start uh, parking their own crypto assets in like digital asset custodians as well in Malaysia. Uh, you talking about Halogen, is it? No, I'm talking Halogen about... Halogen is a fund manager kind of thing, right? Halogen is a fund manager. Okay. Uh, I'm talking about CoKeeps. CoKeeps okay. is okay. Uh, one that was recently announced and I and I believe there's another one. Uh, yeah. But it, it remains to be seen whether they are offering their services to retail customers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what is interesting is that even in the last you know, bull run, right, I, I noticed that I think you did some press releases and I mean the number of wallets and new addresses registered in Malaysia just went through the roof. Yeah. And I'm sure it's, it's been going through the roof, right? So you got Malaysia, you got Australia, you got Indonesia under yep. you, right? Yep. But intriguingly, Malaysia is the biggest market. Yeah. So for let's us. talk about that next. <laughs> for us, In yes. the meantime, because I just want to stay on safety, right? Safety yeah. for, for a customer is very important, right? Um, <clears throat> you had a court case a couple of years ago yes. where I think it was the Sessions Court or the High Court. The Sessions Court, yeah. Sessions Court. Yep. 
Court ruled in the customer's favor. Yeah. Customer said he lost his coins. Yeah. He or she, I can't remember lah, gender, yeah. right? Yeah. Lost their coins on, on your exchange. Yeah. Was successful in that claim. Yeah. And and of course now you're appealing, so there's the there's only really a limited way you can reply on yeah, this, right? Yeah. yeah. But what what's at stake here? What do people need to know? Yeah. Um, yeah, again, thanks, Chong, for mentioning yeah. that. But yeah, so we are appealing. We're in the process of appeal, yeah. which means I also can't say too much because yeah. I don't, don't want to negatively affect anything. But in anything, principle yeah. terms, what's at stake? What do people need to, to realize to make sure that if they don't want to self-custody yeah. and they want to keep on on the exchange, yeah. what do they need to, need to know? What's at yeah. stake? I think the most important thing to mention here is that Luno's security practices and everything are basically industry standard, leading industry standard, right? I mean, this has been uh, verified externally by people who, who review our, our processes and so on. So we are very confident and comfortable with our safety. And in this specific case as well, uh, there was nothing wrong with, with, with Luno system. Security system worked exactly as it was designed to work. So I think the, the one most important thing that people need to realize is that uh, there is some level of uh, responsibility for the customer themselves. And what, what do I mean by this responsibility? It is a matter of quite simple but very important steps. So for example, uh, making sure your email uh, is secure. For example, not, not, not having your email uh, accessed by malicious parties. Uh, making sure your phone has no malware. Right, making sure that you know you don't download weird uh, links or or weird packages that that people may suddenly WhatsApp you. Uh, bec- and why why I say this kind of things is because um, we see that in the in the crypto space, people tend to be people tend to lose funds when they are defrauded. Right, when when somebody promises them. Um, when somebody promises them like huge returns or something, and they willingly decide to like to 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 send their crypto over, or someone says, "Oh, I'll give you this link. Click on this link," and then somebody clicks on that link, and then uh that link actually gives access to that person's computer. Oh and then, my uh, gosh. Like, uh, uh, But how would you know? Yeah. Because you can send links all the time. Yeah. So I think that that's where it's very important to have safe uh personal practices, meaning that only you access your 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 wallet. Only you have access to your email and password. Only you, you don't you don't share passwords or you don't share access or you don't share devices with somebody else. So I think these are like the very, very important steps that, that anyone should take. It doesn't just apply to crypto by the way. It applies for online banking, any like e wallet apps or so on. Just follow these strong operational security practices and you would be okay. Okay. So, so as a customer, what you need to know, you need to do your your okay. So those are the, the external a- yep. apps, right? Don't click on suspicious links. Make sure your email is safe. But within the app itself, within yep. your own system itself, there's things like two FA and yep. there's verified phone number. Yep. So what what do we need? I'm just 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 explain the why's and the wherefores of 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 basically a- yep. exchange security so that people don't get defrauded. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think the the first thing that I've already mentioned is that um, this happens unfortunately. It is very unfortunate, right? Don't believe in like people saying like I'll send you uh, uh, send me your crypto and then I'll double it and and send it back to you like next week, right? Because these are like too good to be true kind of stuff. And unfortunately, we see people uh, having to go through this process like oh I send my crypto out to this uh, scam thing. Can I get my crypto back? Unfortunately, in this case, you, you can't do it, right? Because you've already sent your funds out to somebody uh, because they promised you something and then uh, unfortunately, it turned out that was a scam and so on. Uh, but apart from that, I think something that's uh, very, very uh, powerful to be used is something that is called a trusted device. So when we talk about a trusted device, trusted device is basically a feature where you get uh, push notifications whenever you make uh, a slightly well whenever you make a, an important transaction so for example um, if I am deciding to send like a, a huge amount of crypto funds out I will get a push notif- push notification to my phone so trusted devices is basically a, I would say industry standard at the moment so like uh, banks are using it and so on uh, for example in Maybank it's like the secure to you you know push notifications and so on so I would recommend that everyone also in your app you also activate that trusted devices feature uh, we've actually been running a, a huge amount of campaigns to try and get people hey, activate your 
your your push notifications, activate your push notifications. So I just want to encourage everyone to yeah, please do that lah, because that that gives you the highest level of security. And if you want, you can actually also activate uh, what we call two factor authentication, which somewhat links to a. Uh, um, basically, before you do any high-risk transaction, you need to input a six-digit code. So that's also another option to add to your security. So if you do all those things, then, yep. then it's pretty damn secure already, right? It, it is definitely industry-leading, industry-standard security. And not just for crypto, right? All banking apps, e-wallet apps also use this kind of security measures. So what happens if you lose your phone or someone steals the phone? Um. If you lose your phone or someone steals your phone, um, technically that person would not be able to access your your app because you also would would lock it with uh, either a pin or a biometric security uh, thing. So it's not like they would be able to easily access it as well because yeah, there are features that you have to go through before you're actually able to access it. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So um, let, let's talk about then the whole phenomenon of the fact that crypto seems to just going bananas in Malaysia, right? Um, I think I was there two or three years ago, I saw a press release that you issued and you said the number of accounts has just ballooned. Yep. I just shuddered to think how many new accounts in the last two years, lah, right? Yeah. And bizarrely, M- Malaysia is the biggest market for you guys yeah. as a regional provider Yeah. Uh, versus Indonesia or Australia, which are three countries under you, right? Yeah. Can yeah. you explain that? What's going on? Yeah. I think in Malaysia specifically, um, we've actually been, I mean, I, I would say definitely been very blessed, right? Because the, the, the population has, has taken to uh, supporting Luno, basically. Uh, but I would say that we are actually quite, um, we're actually very, we find it very interesting because I think Malaysians uh, and, and the Luno product, we are quite attractive to, to, to the Malaysian public because um, I think we are, we are crypto native in the sense that we have all the, the crypto features, buy, sell, send, receive, and so on. So we are quite a crypto you're native. You're talking about your app. app. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. We're, quite, we're quite crypto native. But also I would say we're not like super, super complex or complicated that it turns off a lot of people. No, I think my yeah. question is really, why is Mal- why do Malaysians seem to have taken, my assumption is Malaysians yeah. seem to have taken to crypto quite naturally, yeah. right? Yeah. Why? I think, you know, People in um, well, we we like tech, right? Malaysians like tech. We we versus we're open. Indonesians and Australians. That that seems bizarre. Well, or, I or mean, I think I I guess yeah. what I'm trying to say yeah. is, can you explain the market dynamics, the country yeah. market dynamics? Yeah. So I think in Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, I think we are quite similar in the sense that we like emerging technologies and so on. I think in terms of the the adoption, I think my earlier comment is is it's not that. Crypto isn't like widely adopted in Indonesia and so on. It just so happens that uh, Luno, the the amount of customers we have in Indonesia as a percentage of market share, uh, we're actually doing better in Malaysia. So Indonesia crypto adoption is also off the also charts. Off the also charts. Also okay, off the okay, charts. Okay. It's just from a Luno perspective. So it's off perspective. the charts everywhere. Like, it's off it? the charts everywhere. But I would say that in Australia, perhaps being more of a first world country, I think you see that adoption tends to be higher in the emerging markets. Yeah. So for example, Malaysia and Indonesia, probably as a percentage of population, you're going to see crypto is much more interesting versus say a, a country like Australia. That's bizarre. That's bizarre. Okay. So so um what I understand from from just some basic reading, right, is that um the amount of utility around the world of crypto or adoption has been predominantly Asian. Predominantly Asian. So the new wallets registered, for example, mm-hmm. has g- generally come more from Asia. I'm not sure why. Um, and also, yeah. and also generally, I think on a global basis, the amount of Bitcoin held on wallets for more than I think a year or long term holders yep. has also been something like I think something like sixty percent of Bitcoin or seventy percent of Bitcoin isn't in the open market. They're just being mm. held long term in, yep. in wallets, right? Yep. So this is general macro. Um, crypto indicators, which I just want you to explain what is the Malaysian situation and and why that's the case, yeah. or rather the Asia Pacific situation. Yeah, I think uh, something something I mentioned earlier, right? I think in a lot of emerging markets, crypto is like very very um, crypto is very very popular 
because I think a lot of people are actually searching for ways, as I mentioned, to grow their wealth, yeah. right? What are the ways that I can grow and secure my wealth for the future? So for many people, they look at, oh, crypto, this is a new asset class. You know, I should be heavily into it. Now, why I mentioned a little bit about like first world countries and so on is we have seen trends in the past where people in first world countries perhaps may not be so interested in crypto because for one, perhaps I'm, I'm speculating a bit. They're already like a first world country, you know, they're quite well developed. People are generally having quite high standards of living and their currency is strong and so on. So perhaps that's a reason why crypto tends to be popular in emerging markets as opposed to like first world markets. Now, in terms of the, the point you mentioned around um, crypto that hasn't moved, crypto that is stored in like cold wallets, you know, not on the exchange, uh, crypto that hasn't really moved. It goes back to the fact that a lot of people are choosing to store their wealth in crypto. They're not actually, I mean, there are people who like to trade it, right? There are people who like to buy, sell, move it around. But there are also a lot of people who say, okay, I'm just going to buy this. I'm going to hold it for the future. And this is where you see the crypto that does not move. The crypto that's stored and just doesn't move because people are sort of long-term investing. Yeah, so in terms of cycles, right, I think we've had multiple cycles since mm. 2009 when Bitcoin first came on the market. Yeah. We've had, I think, four, three or four, what they call winters. La. Yeah. And the, the weird the thing about crypto markets is that they go crazy. They go crazy all time high and then it crashes 80%, right? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's just this bananas phenomenon, right? And then the whole thing just starts again over the next, you know, then there's winter, 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 then there's this crypto summer, right? And then it just goes bananas again and then it crashes 80% again. And in between, there's like, there's like volatility differences like 20, 30% mm -hmm. movements and multiple, multiple, maybe a couple dozen, right? Yep. First of all, do you think those things will continue to be the phenomenon? And secondly, why is the market so volatile? Yeah. The view is that as more and more, what we say, traditional investors or more and more institutions come in, the view is that the market would eventually become less and less volatile because I think it is volatile. If you look at the history, predominantly the investors in crypto have been retail investors. Retail investors mean perhaps they're a little bit less sophisticated than, 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 than what you call financial institutions and so on. So maybe market movements spook them and, and this has led to a lot of volatility in the past. Lah. So the view is that at some point, more and more institutional money comes in and you would imagine that these are very, very uh, seasoned investors. So volatility may not be such a, a scary thing. And that will actually normalize the market. Lah. Now, again, this is a bit of a projection because you never know what happens. But I think it is somewhat of a reasonable projection to, uh, to, 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 to share. Sorry, what was the other question? <laughs> you asked yeah, me. I mean, just really just yeah. the, the huge swings in, yeah. in price activity. So, I mean, I yeah. guess if you're a long-term Bitcoin holder or long-term crypto holder, yeah. do you have the cojones to hold them through this <laughs> huge... I mean, yeah. Like, yeah. You, you made this amazing paper gains. Yeah. And then if you don't sell in time, it's just going to go ba -da bam and then you go wait another two, three years before the that, you know, then... Yeah. So, so obviously, the... the, the the, the prevailing wisdom in crypto is, is that you've got to sell before the winter sets in, lah, right? And then you buy in again when it's high. My yeah. question is, do you need to do that in the future? I, Who I've, knows, right? Yeah. But what's yeah. your sense? I've, I've always come from the slightly different perspective. And I agree, right? You have to be able to, <clears throat> you have to be able to stomach volatility. But I've always, at least personally, I've come from a buy and hold kind of perspective. So whether it drops like, 30%, 50% and so on. I mean, I've, I've held like for, for, for many, many years uh, because I'm, I'm a believer in digital assets in the future as what we've mentioned just now. So I would like to, to take it from that approach. I, I do believe that volatility will, will, will reduce as we, as we move into the future because of the institutional money. But um, I think a lot of people I know or a lot of people I've seen have made losses trying to time the market trying to say, oh, okay, I at this point, I'm going to get out or at this point, I'm going to get in. And I think that applies not just to crypto, but many other markets, right? People who are trying to time the market, I think usually end up feeling or disappointed or so on. So I, I would like to take a long-term investing approach. And I think the other thing I wanted to mention was, I think a lot of that also stems from not taking on too much risk, right? So I think perhaps where a lot of this... Um, feeling that oh I'm going to try to time the market is because maybe people have invested 
or people have traded a little bit too much that they need to like get their capital in and out. But I think if you invested perhaps uh, an amount that you're you're willing to stomach volatility, then you'll be able to hold through the ups and downs. Yeah, I mean, certainly the last three years, KLCI has not gone anywhere, right? So if you wanted any kind of alpha, for example, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you've had no choice but to buy in the crypto markets, right? And um, unfortunately, you know, the rally's only been six six months old. And what you're saying is that the rally hasn't even begun, right? <laughs> uh, or really with the early throws of this, bit, this is crypto bull run, right? So again, I mean, what's your sense? Because ETF flows have been huge. I read yeah. somewhere that it's like, you know, ETF... ETF funds are now accounting for three or somewhere two or three percent of yeah. the entire market cap of, of Bitcoin already, yeah. which yeah. is huge, right? Yeah. And and the more the more institutional money comes to the Bitcoin, yeah. the less volatile it'll be. Yeah. And therefore, in some sense, the, the less craziness of the huge price swings in the future. Yeah. So that means there's only one or two more cycles left to make some serious money, lah, right? So can you talk through those whole phenomenon? Yeah, I think the the thing about uh, institutional money coming in we've seen so much so much interest from yeah. the ETF so much yeah. interest from like you know I, I think we were chatting about it just now earlier like it's been the best ETF launch of all by time far. right better by than far. Goal, right? Yeah, better than yeah, goal. Miles, yeah. so I, I do see that trend continuing right I do see that trend continuing as to like you know where the market can go it's a bit hard to tell again Bitcoin's only been around for like 15 years um, you know, some people are giving crazy price predictions and so on. I'm not going to give any crazy... I'll save you the blushes. <laughs> I, I'm not going to give any crazy price predictions. But, but again, I think I personally invest because I believe in it as a long-term asset, right? Okay. And I mean, I think everyone has to make their own decisions. Like if, if you believe in the future of digital assets and so on, I think Bitcoin is a, a very uh, interesting investment asset class right now. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I'll put out those price projections because I know you can't, right? You'll be in trouble, <laughs> right? So I've, I've variously yeah. heard in this cycle, yes. um, 100,000 is not an issue, okay? Yeah. Not an issue. Uh, some people say a reasonable amount to aim for is 150,000. Mm-hmm. And I think bull case is something like 500,000. Wow. And of course, someone like Kathy Wood of ARC will say something at like 1 million or whatever. Yeah. I think Jamie Demons of JP Morgan has said that as well. Uh, and some wow. people have gone beyond that. Of course, 10 years, 10 years cycle. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay? Some people say Solana will surpass Ethereum's market cap. I think wow. Ethereum's market cap is like 45 billion. Yeah, 45 billion. And right now, it's Solana is something like 20, hmm. 30 billion or something. No, sorry. Hmm. Ethereum's market cap is something like 500 billion now, right? Okay. 400, 500 billion something? Yeah, yeah and correct. Eth- and Solana's market cap is something like 80 billion now. Hmm. And they are going to gun for Ethereum's yeah. market cap, which is like five times the price, yeah. which will make Solana $1,000 per coin. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so I've also heard yeah. that the way to look at crypto assets is to look at it from the perspective of buying into Amazon or or or, or Tesla yep. or, or Netflix in the early days, right? Yep. Because they were untested, they're unproven, but the new technologies, new platforms. Yeah. And so, if that was the case, then it would be easy to reconcile in your mind. Hmm. Imagine if you had bought Amazon at nine bucks a share yeah. in two thousand and two. Yeah. Back when I was a journalist in Bloomberg. If I bought Amazon then, I wouldn't be talking to you too today, right? <laughs> I'm in the Bahamas, right? <laughs> so you and me both, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So would that be a simplified way of looking at these? Because there's, there are new technologies, there are yeah. new platforms, and there are kind of like new applications for the future. Yeah. I like the way you put it, Chong, because uh, it is certainly one way people are, are evaluating investments into crypto assets. There's so kind of there's, there's some read across, right? Some yeah. Some... Yeah, some imagery in your mind, right? Yeah. So some people say it's it's a little bit like investing in an early tech stock. Again, mm. some of the coins that you mentioned, Solana, Ethereum, they're not even 10 years old. I think Ethereum might be reaching 10 years soon. I think yeah. Solana is a, yeah. a lot younger than that. Yeah. So a lot of it is, uh, as you mentioned, unproven, untested. Some testing has been done. Some has, has, some has been proved. But again, we are we're very, very early. So... I think I like that that imagery of this could be like investing in a a bit like venture investing into a new kind of tech stock, especially if you come from from the stock market way of viewing things, lah. Um. So, you know, in terms of price predictions, it's a bit hard to tell. Nobody but knows, yeah, yeah, nobody knows. But I think maybe my one personal way of uh how I try to reconcile this is try to actually use the technology, right? Try to actually use the technology and 
you might actually discover like, oh, okay, I, I am actually uh, very comfortable. I want to deep dive. I want, I want to test more into this ecosystem. For example, we're chatting about like, um, you know, you can buy Bitcoin, uh, you can buy Ethereum, but also you can actually try using apps that are built on Ethereum, right? Th this is like somewhat in the decentralized space, in the decentralized world. Or you could try using apps that are built in the Solana ecosystem. And personally, I found a lot of value like, actually trying out the apps themselves because then it feeds into my belief oh okay this you know crypto coins are not just like a, a means some people say it's just a means for speculation but i would say that you know i've i've actually driven a lot of utility from actually testing out these coins uh, and their ecosystem myself yeah i mean i've for example when i've used certain coins to, mm. to do certain transactions yeah. some are much faster yeah and some are definitely a lot cheaper than, than see, ethereum is crazy expensive lah, right <laughs> <laughs> and some other i think i think xrp is pretty much almost free right to use yeah. to, to yeah. facilitate transactions yeah um i just want to talk about how some people talk about this whole um etf um uh, approval by the sec in america as bitcoin's e ipo moment yeah yeah when 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 those etfs got approved by sec Suddenly there was price discovery, right? Yeah, and and that and therefore you you know it's kind of like oh now you re now you'll really find out the true price of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. But being the biggest and the most established, it's at its IPO moment. Fine. Yeah. But then other IPO moments have yet to come. So the Ethereum ETF would be its IPO moment. Some people talk about the Solana ETF also being one day approved. Yeah. Down in the future. Yeah. As you get more and more further down the the market cap ratings, so on and so forth. What do you think of that idea that? The as the ETF approval was an IPO moment. Is that accurate? Is that a, a realistic assessment? I, I quite, I quite like, uh, I quite like the 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 term the IPO moment. It, it's basically the moment when people could not ignore Bitcoin as an asset class anymore, right? Because it's basically there. You know, it's trading with all the other ETFs of the yeah. world. So it's basically crossing, you know, it's crossing a milestone at the moment. So um, something you mentioned, like, you know, would there be a ET uh, Ethereum ETF one day? Would there be, you know, Solana ETF one day? I think May is like the decision for Ethereum ETF. So, oh, you know, every, right? yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, it, it may not be approved, right? It could be delayed or, you oh. know, it could be it could be a no. But, you know, people are eagerly watching. And I, I do believe, I do 100% believe that, you know, digital assets will continue to come into our world. And our current financial institutions will continue to work together with dig this digital assets. The time is no longer where people can say, "Oh, you know, Bitcoin is 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 not like a, it's not a real thing, right?" So let, let's just ignore it. The time has come where people are figuring out, okay, how should we work with these digital assets already? Yeah. So what is weird is that there's a re-centralization of this original decentralized <laughs> idea, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And the yeah. fact that you work yeah, in a yeah. central exchange yes, is, is yes, one of them, right? Yes. The fact that you got to get approval from Bank Nagara mm -hmm. to operate in Malaysia along with four other players, yeah, is also proof of re-centralization, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and can you explain that because ETF is also a re-centralization yep. of of what was yeah, a decentralized yeah. asset, yes, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So can you explain that? Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm a bit of a pragmatist. A, practical, pragmatic kind of person, right? Um, so if you look at Bitcoin's history, there are some people still today in like the, the crypto space who say that, no, 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 all this is, is not right, right? Crypto digital assets should be decentralized. Let's get it away from like the traditional financial systems because they were not meant to mix. But my view is that without the, the mixing, without the adaption, without the evolution of these two systems, Crypto would forever be a niche asset that only maybe less than 1% of the population uses, right? So for crypto to truly become uh, popular, for it, to, uh, for it to touch many, many people and for many, many people to be able to store wealth in it, it was inevitable that the worlds of uh, traditional financial institutions and digital assets would actually come and merge. Yeah. So what tectonic movements can upend this whole thing? Like yeah. for example, what happens if Satoshi, if he were actually alive, yeah. would have come out and say, "April Fools, guys!" Right? <laughs> <laughs> it was a big, yeah. it was a huge joke and experiment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or what happens if like there's an electromagnetic frequency wave that yeah. just zap the the world and all the systems went down and all yeah. the memory was obliterated, right? Yeah. So yeah. all the Bitcoin, all the blockchain is entirely obliterated, right? Yeah. Or yeah. whatever, right? <laughs> I don't know. There's so yeah, many things yeah. that can happen, right? Yeah. Um, what would upend this system? Or for example, yeah. even the US 
government, right? Yeah. What if what if they say, oh, we're gonna outlaw um self custody, for example? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, a bit of a tough question to answer because hypothetical. We, we don't know, right? Yeah. We don't I mean, know we, don't we don't know. know. But but I would say that, you know, especially in the case of Bitcoin, right? Because of how how much it has grown, how entrenched it is, and you know, governments are not by large. I mean, apart from certain exceptions, governments are not like saying oh, we outlaw digital assets anymore, right? Regulations are being built around how we can have digital assets existing and coexisting with uh, the traditional financial sector. So I would say the, at least from a government ban, that kind of perspective, that is like very, very likely behind us. Maybe there are one, two governments who still like, you know, really, really don't want it. But I would say that, you know, we've, we, we're also beyond that point. And as, as you know, like other freak scenarios, I think we'll, we'll just have to see how, how robust the, <laughs> so the system is. Because if that was the case, yeah. then the share markets will go down yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, anything that's electronic would basically go down if like, you know, you have a EM wave. So, yeah. yeah. So one of the reasons why people buy into the whole crypto phenomenon is this whole debasement idea, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, governments around the world, including mm-hmm. the US, Japan, and Europe, the European Central Bank, they're printing money like there's no tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And the underlying fiat paper currency, what they call fiat currency, yeah. Is is valueless la. so mm. that's why they go into finite assets like say Bitcoin yep. and, and gold, right? Yeah. Um, but the thing is, those cryptocurrencies are expressed in US dollars anyway, hmm. so that that linkage exists. If the dollar went down, then surely the crypto markets would also go down, no? Or how how would that how does that interplay work? Yeah. If you ask like a a true 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 crypto believer, mm. like like really really like true libertarian crypto believer. They would tell you that okay, one day, uh, we wouldn't, we might not even price in US dollars. Correct. We would price, price completely in, in Bitcoin, yeah. right? I've heard that before. Yeah. However, whether that is a pragmatic view, whether it is possible, I mean, it's it's. I would say at this moment, it's a bit hard to imagine that yeah. happening, lah. So I do think that in terms of currency, governments, central banks will always have their currencies, right? So you know whether that um whether that, that currency values or devalues or so on, uh, I think it's, it's a bit out of, you know, out, I would say it's out of most people's control. Lah. But I think what most people can do and what a lot of people are doing is basically that's why they're investing in gold, that's why they're investing in digital assets because they see that hey, it is something that is somewhat independent from the systems, right? And I think something interesting is also you found that um, Bitcoin in its all-time, all-time high price, right? it actually happened in a lot of countries before the US. So most people say that, oh, Bitcoin reached its all-time high when it reached, when it crossed $70,000, which I think was a, a few weeks ago. But in many, many countries, in the local currency, Bitcoin actually crossed the all-time high like maybe two, three months before that. How does that work? Because of the currency devaluation in terms of like, in USD, Bitcoin 70,000 crossed the, the, the all-time high. But in some other countries, for example, let's say like, uh, I don't know, maybe Turkey or Egypt or something, Bitcoin had already crossed the all-time high because the local currency wasn't doing so well. So actually, you know, the even the direct conversion from Bitcoin to local currency uh, was actually reaching all-time highs much earlier. Yeah, and then of course, uh, people also talk about how the price will be moved. For example, Today's mm. all-time high yep. and the last all-time high two years ago in a bit, inflation was a big thing, right? Yeah. yeah. And because inf- inflation is such a big thing, this current price of 70000 or whatever it is yep. doesn't yet reflect the taking into account inflation. Mm. Mm. So can you explain yeah. that? Yeah. So the, the, the inflation theory is that, you know, $70,000 today is not should be discounted back. <laughs> yeah, because, should be right? discounted back. Right. <laughs> so maybe, yeah, true. Maybe it is in terms of US dollars. Lah. Maybe I don't know how much the inflation rates and so on. You have to discount it back. But I mean, I think as as an investor, I I actually don't look too much into like the 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 the, the, the what you call it, the the details. But I I think my my perspective is like, you know, if I believe that this is a important store of value. I'm going to invest in it long term, lah, right? Yeah. And and hopefully whatever happens, currencies and so on, you know, uh, hopefully this store of value continues to 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 protect my 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 wealth. Okay, so a couple of the drivers that were supposed to move the Bitcoin price this year has happened. Mm-hmm. So one of them was the US SEC's yep. approval of the ETFs, but then the other couple of things that haven't happened yet, for example, yeah. 
um, the change in monetary policy by the U.S. Federal mm-hmm. Reserve, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because once they drop rates, then typically there's a correlation between low interest rates and, yep. and risk assets, which yeah. include tech stocks and, yeah. and crypto prices, right? Yeah. That hasn't happened yet. Yes. And then, of course, you've got the U.S. government elections, which are typically you know full of spending by the mm-hmm. I- incumbents lah, to make people feel good. Yeah. Typically, like what politicians do. Mm-hmm. That hasn't happened yet, right? Yeah. Um, do you see that as a further driver of, of asset prices? I think it'll definitely affect it one way or another. Uh, something that you mentioned, um, the correlation between lower interest rates yeah. and um, you know riskier assets. So whether that's uh, tech stocks or, or or Bitcoin, we've definitely seen that before. So I think a lot of people are are, are eagerly watching. Like, are we going to go back to a lower interest rate environment? Uh, and if that's the case, then yeah, definitely people are going to be quite bullish on on Bitcoin crypto. In terms of like US elections and so on, I think definitely it's going to have an impact. I just don't know, like, I don't know yeah. what, which way it's going <laughs> to have an impact because depending on who wins and their policies and so on, yeah, remains to be seen. Yeah, so because this whole space is getting more, I guess, uh, established and mm. more mature, right? Um, and so I guess, you know, because right now we're talking about fees, right? Fees yep. on your exchange, they tend to vacillate between 2% for your simplified, yep. m- you know, m- manner. Yep down to as low as 0% or near zero yep. for more bigger bigger traders, like yep. I think, right? Yep. So can you explain your pricing structure and over time, as the market gets more mature, whether yep. you start to lower prices? Because I think even in, in the ETFs, right? Some of those ETFs are really, I mean, really yep. dirt cheap, yep. right? Yep. Um, I, I can't remember which one. I think Van Eck or something was really, yep. really cheap. And then some like Grayscale was really expensive. Mm-hmm. So there's room for you to drop price commission commissions right on your exchange what's your what's your feedback there so yeah let me make it cheaper for people to buy (laughs) yeah yeah. Yeah. let me just uh, start by sharing the uh, current fees so current fees as you mentioned if you use the simplified buy or sell it's a 2% fee Uh, 2% so basically if you're buying like uh, 10 ringgit worth of crypto that's uh, I think 20 cents Mm. yeah 2% is 20 cents so uh, it's designed to be simple fast uh, efficient uh, and then if you use the more complex exchange mode, so that looks a little bit more like your traditional stockbroking interface, then you'll be able to trade from as low as 0% all the way up to, I think, 0.6%. So it depends on your transaction volume. Basically, if you're doing a lot of trades and you're uh, using the maker function, you'll be able to trade as, as low as 0% depending on your trade volume. Now, in terms of fees, um, we are constantly evaluating. We're trying to figure out, you know, what's the what's the best way to 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 give value to our customers, like any other business, right? Um, so yeah, maybe one day. But I think at this moment, we're we're quite comfortable with the fees, and yeah, maybe one day. Yeah. So the cheaper you are, the better, lah, right? For, <laughs> for customer, yes. Right? Yes. Understood. Yeah, understood. Yeah. yeah. So so then in terms of the number of tokens available in the exchange, I yeah. think right now you got like nine or something. Eleven. Like Eleven. Yep. Okay. Yep. Some of them, I mean, quite esoteric. Uh, Avalanche is one of them. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. I can't remember what else you got. Yeah. And then I can't, because I, I think I called you on this a few weeks ago, right? Yes. I think I saw some press release from an, into my email saying that Algorand mm-hmm. will eventually be be available. Yeah. So in the, in, I guess just in terms of how you think these things through, how do you assess the possibility of putting a token on your exchange? Yeah. What is the thinking process there? And what is the regulatory process there? Um, yeah. what, what are the things that are involved? What's at stake? Yeah. So I'll say, I'll start with the, the last one. Like, what's the regulatory process? So in Malaysia, currently, any coin token that's listed on a digital asset exchange, whether it's Luno or any of the others, you have to go through an approval process. Currently, that's the, the, the process. Okay. So approval process means you have to write a paper. Regulators need to look at it and say, okay, this looks fine. It doesn't look too risky or you know too dangerous for the market. So that's the current process. In terms of our thinking, where Luno's perspective is, I think we want to offer the most popular and the most uh, established coins right now. So that means that, you know, unfortunately, we're probably not going to offer like some very, very exotic, you know. No, top, so no Shiba, no, 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 no coins. <laughs> I think if you talk in terms of meme coins, I think that's probably going to be two challenges. Yeah. One would be our internal, you know, our internal policy, like, you know, do we want to, we, do we want to offer meme coins? Probably not. No, yeah. And then I think regulators would most likely not want to allow that to happen as well. So how much, how knowledgeable is the SE in Malaysia? Um, I mean, my assumption yep. is that they don't have a deep understanding. 
I yeah. could, I, I'm probably wrong, right? Yeah. And and what makes what cuts the mustard when when you want to put the toast? Because you want something which is established. Yeah. And there's a correlation with safety, right? Yeah. But there's also a necessity for that coin to move. Yes. Up in a in a in a material way. Yeah. For it to make sense to investors, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um. I'll I'll share this lah. Um. I think when I came into the space like many years ago now, I think that was more than six years ago now. Uh, I came in like quite new to the space and um, I was actually quite pleasantly surprised when I deal with with people at the SE because they have their own internal experts on like uh, digital assets as well. So it's not like uh, a lot of people may say, oh, regulators, you know, what do they know and so on. But actually the SE, they have their own internal experts. And I think we have a, a very good working relationship. Lah. Like we can discuss things and so on. But ultimately they are looking basically to protect the investors, the Malaysian investors, right? So they're not going to approve something that's weird or, you know, comes from shady characters or, you know, something that's basically like a joke coin or something. It, I, I don't see a world where they, they approve such coins. Uh. Um, and yeah, I think they are also looking to make sure that, you know, they're not, we don't see like pump and dump kind of coins on, on Malaysian crypto exchanges because that would be like, terrible for the uh, most people yeah yeah so 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 um what are the con- what are the i guess top five considerations for your platform yeah to think about when it comes to putting a coin in exchange because yeah even if you stay in the top 50 by yeah. market cap right there's a few pretty good projects in there right yeah yeah so so in, in your in your you know short list yeah what considerations do you take place yeah yeah i'll, I'll say maybe the top three lah. i think number one is uh reputation so, you know, is 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 the coin legitimate? Because I think if you've been in the digital asset crypto space for a while, you understand that certain coins are basically memes or jokes and so on. So is it like really a legitimate project which actually has legitimate use cases, which, you know, there's actually a thriving ecosystem and so on? How do you audit that? How do you audit legitimacy? How would you know? I mean, short of going to those headquarters yeah. in wherever, Palo Alto or whatever, right? Yeah. Yeah. How would you know? Yeah. I think a lot of crypto projects are basically open source, right? A lot of it. I'm not saying all crypto projects are open source. So you can actually look at, uh, you can actually do a technical assessment. Okay, what are the technical features of this uh, uh, of this coin? You know, what kind of uh, validation system do they use? You can look at adoption. You can look at how many people are actually using this coin. You can look at the, the developers. Are they just like simply put up a project and then abandon it? Or do they actually maintain the, the, I think they call it the repository of uh, codes and so on. So you can look at some of these factors. Uh, and then I think also importantly, you can look at the founders. Lah. I think most crypto projects today are non, no longer anonymous. So you actually know who exactly is the person. You can do some sort of due diligence on whether this founder is a reasonable guy or if he has like some controversy and so on. So I think these are some of the factors we look at. And I think it's quite possible to do a thorough due diligence nowadays. Uh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, even then it's not fail safe, right? Because I mean, FTX had their own coin and yep. look at where FTX went, right? Yeah. Yeah. And Sam Bankman was the blue-eyed boy. And, <laughs> yes. You know, yes. He's now 25 years in the dog, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so what can we expect from you guys this year? Why how many more tokens and you know what kind of things? Can yeah. you name some? I name one of them, right? <laughs> For some reason, it yeah. inadvertently turned up in my inbox. I'm like, okay, Algorand is interesting. Yeah, yeah. So Algorand is, uh, I think it's being planned for list. Oh, it's already listed in some of our international exchanges. Yep. Um, currently, we actually have two coins that are on the way. I, I, unfortunately, I can't name the coins, but we have two coins that are going to be launched quite soon. Uh, so that's that will take us up to 13 coins. Uh, something we haven't spoken about, but we recently launched staking in Q1 as well. Yeah, but your returns are <clears throat> average. <la. laughs> <laughs> I think I signed up for your Ether staking. Yeah, so yeah, percent yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. Three-ish, three-ish, three-ish somewhere yeah. between 3 to 4% yeah. at the moment per annum. Um, I think that gives investors an uh, opportunity. It's like FD like that, la, is it? It's it's somewhat like, I mean, if you compare it to maybe FD slash money market kind of or thing. Or dividend, right? Yeah. Right. So I think a lot of investors actually quite like it because they were keeping their tokens, their, their digital assets on Luno anyway, but now they're able to get some rewards for it. So I think okay. that's quite popular. The take-up rate has been quite good. So in, in the traditional world, you have share price gain and mm. dividend, la, is yes, it? Yes, ah, yes, yes. Okay, okay. Analogy, la, of course, okay. it's not exactly the same, but ah. you are getting uh, some form of rewards for your, your crypto. Mm. Uh, yeah, I think we want to get as many tokens as possible. We, we, we Again, we're trying to work with regulators. La, you know, for example, 
are we able to move to a regime where uh, we're able to list a lot more tokens without having to go through formal approval for each single one. Now, I think this is uh, not just our wish, but I think throughout the industry, I think the whole crypto industry in Malaysia, we are definitely speaking to regulators. Uh, can we get to that someday? And looking forward. So what is your sense of the regulatory uh, viewpoint? Because they're playing this twin role. Like they want to develop new markets, yep. right? Yep. At the same time, they want to protect investors. So they're yep. constantly fighting this, this battle, trying to find an elegant... Yep. So in America, the U US SEC... Gary Gensler, right? Yes. He's been said to be a crypto critic, but then at MIT, he was lecturing on Bitcoin. Yes. So that's bizarre, right? <laughs> yes, bizarre. What, what, <laughs> so what do you make of Gary Gensler and how he approaches this? Because he, he, I think, begrudgingly approved those ETFs, right? It, the, appeared, the language it, that was used was quite begrudging. Like, yeah, yeah, it was it appeared so, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, but yeah. they are the, kind of like the Paul Barrows, right? Yeah. So can you explain that? Yeah, I mean, a bit, I, I would say a bit out of my expertise in terms of... Uh, Gary Gensler, but well, maybe in terms yeah. of maybe your yeah. Malaysia, Indonesia, Australia uh, yeah. regulatory approach, right? Yeah. Are they more market promotive or are they more market protective? Um, I think in Malaysia, specifically in Malaysia, there is still um, there's still a big. I I think the the regulators still feel this need to to protect uh investors, consumers as much as possible. Uh, so as you, as you rightly point out, it, it is quite a, a battle. I think mm. internally they also, you know, how how flexible, how loose should we make this? Uh, but but yeah, I think there are also voices that are saying, okay, you know, let's continue to be cautious and so on. So yeah, it's it's. I wish I had like more concrete yeah. answers, but it's it's really quite a a back and forth it's a at the moment. Dialogue, yeah, constant dialogue, right? yeah, yeah. And then right now, I think um, gains in the yep. crypto world remain tax free. Is that correct? So um, how, how does the whole yeah. tax framework work? It's it's actually no different from any other investment asset at the moment, Chuang. So if you are trading like an income, mm. like you are trading day in, day out, that's your source of income. By right, la, by right, you should be you declaring should declare, to tax. Uh, yeah. Okay. But if you're doing it like capital gains, like you buy, invest, and hold and you sell later. I think LHDN, it's quite clear la, that this is capital in nature and there's no taxes. Okay, but there's this idea that there's be in, in time to come a digital tax uh, or some kind of tax on, on gains, right? Hmm. In the crypto world. Is is that something which you're, in your mind you've talked to regulators about and, and what's the situation there? Um, we've not heard of like potential digital asset taxes in Malaysia. But I can share a situation in Indonesia because it's quite clear that in Indonesia, there was quite a punitive tax imposed on regulated crypto exchanges in Indonesia. Um, so even like on buy, sell, you get tax, get tax, get tax. And we saw like very clearly, right, there was a huge outflow. Like people stopped trading on regulated crypto exchanges and all the activity went offshore. So it's quite well known in Indonesia that the industry there, including ourselves, are lobbying like, you know, look, let's be sensible about the taxes. Because if you tax it so high, people are just going to use the unregulated offshore markets and so on. So I think in Malaysia, we haven't heard of any such taxes incoming. Uh, but I think it's also, uh, I, I would say our view is that let's be pragmatic about it. Let's encourage the use of regulated exchanges and hopefully governments worldwide, not just in Asia, can continue to encourage it. Lah. Yeah, I think we also talked, I touched on tokenization earlier, right? Mm -hmm. How does tokenization work? Um, and at some point in time, I think the you know the the crypto maximalists talk about how everything in the future yeah. will be tokenized, right? Yeah. And also talk in terms of how central bank digital currencies might come in the future, because I think that's an assumption that will be come true in the future as well. Yeah. Uh, wow. Well, a lot of topics. Okay. Yeah, a lot of topics. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so tokenization yeah. and CBDCs, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So I think tokenization at its at its core, it's taking something may or may not be an existing financial asset. Give you an example. Um, US treasuries. Uh, it's quite popular nowadays to tokenize them. I think even big companies like Franklin Templeton, they've actually tokenized their uh, US treasuries and sold it uh, blockchain, sold it on the blockchain. So right? how, how does that work? So what is tokenization as a concept? How does it work? Yep. So it's basically instead of buying a well in those old days if you buy a bond you get a certificate right yeah. or a share certificate so maybe level one is basically everything is online trading now right everything is uh, in your account 
Level two, which we call like the tokenization, is instead of just I can see it in my account, I can actually see it on the blockchain. I can see that I actually own, say, $1,000 of US treasuries because I own that US treasury token. Now, what that token is called, maybe it's called UTT, right? U US mm -hmm. treasury token. Mm -hmm. So maybe I can see that I own 1,000 UTT. So that's what you call a tokenization. Now, it doesn't have to be treasuries, right? It could be... Uh, Let's say real estate. So let's say I tokenize my apartment building and I call it a uh, APT token, right? And I could own like 100 APT tokens and so on. So the the it's it's quite a strong narrative now that I think BlackRock is on it as well. I think Larry Fink was saying that we view like many, many things will be tokenized, including stocks and, and other things as well. So uh, I think a lot of people are very bullish on this right now. Um your other question was what? Yeah, Sorry. I can see the appeal behind that because once you put things on the blockchain, yeah. the veracity is near as, um, yeah. you know, un well, unimpeachable, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's accurate as hell, right? Yeah. So the, the use cases will be immense, right? Yeah. Whether it's, um, yeah. you know, real estate property deeds or yeah. your share price certificates or yeah. anything which is of value, yeah. you know, your Rolex or whatever, yeah. whatever right? Yeah. Um, this whole idea about you know the digital future la, I think yeah. we have established that the future is going to be more digital than today right yes so that's why cryptos kind of make sense right central banks want to digitalize their yeah. currencies right yeah so you could see a CBDC ring it in mm -hmm. the future mm -hmm. yeah what's involved is there yeah. a risk and the Orwellians among us will say hey let, let's not do that because <laughs> they can see every single yeah. thing right yeah and cash will no longer yeah. be a phenomenon because in, 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 the, in the in the cash world you yeah. can pretty much get away with illicit activities right but in CBDCs, you can't. So, <laughs> yeah. so, so again, I, I know you know a long time, activity, right? Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. You know yeah. they say don't touch Bitcoin because, you know, drug dealers use it. But then, so is the US dollar, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> drug mm -hmm. yes. So I know this, I know you don't have a lot of time. Yes. Um. So, it's, so I, maybe we can just end with CBDCs and what's involved. Yeah. So CBDC is basically taking your central bank currency and then you're tokenizing it, right? Yeah. So yeah. it used to be, it used to be a ringgit it used to be maybe... Paper ringgit. Uh, uh, paper uh, ringgit. Maybe not even paper ringgit because central bank, right? At central bank level, it used to be a ledger entry between a commercial bank and Bank Negara. It used to be a ledger entry, right? Yeah. Um, so basically, you're creating a, a, a tokenized version of that. So, you know, maybe it exists on a public blockchain, private blockchain, whatever. Um, I think it's important to differentiate. There are what we call retail CBDCs and there are... I think they call it wholesale. I think the fear around like tracking and so on, that would apply to like retail CBDC. So instead of using my normal cash or my normal e-wallet, now the, the, the government um, issues what we call the, the, the central bank digital currency for use in retail. Now, from my understanding, retail CBDCs aren't like, super popular at the moment because all the, the things you mentioned, like surveillance, lack, lo loss of privacy and so on, right? I understand that more of the work is currently being done on the wholesale level. So let's say US or Malaysia wants to trade in their uh, central bank currencies. Instead of going down the traditional route, they are using their tokenized versions of those, uh, uh, what do you call that? Um, uh, currencies. So, I mean, there could be multiple multiple benefits. For example, instant settlement, uh, better transparency, less fees, you know, cheaper transactions and so on. So, yeah, I think for the for most people uh, today, I don't think you have to worry too much about the retail CBDCs. That, that doesn't seem to be the flavor of the month. I think yeah. right now it's between government to government. Okay, so I mean, clearly, clearly, I, mean, I think just from the last hour and a half, yeah, we are definitely looking at a much more digital future, like, hundred you know, percent, five yeah. ten years from now. I can't even imagine, right? Yeah. So I guess let's just end with with you, I you know, um, t giving some kind of prognosis in terms of what the market looks like, and maybe mm. not even ten years or three years yeah. time, right? Yeah. Where where are you gonna be in three years time? Wow. Um, where, do, where does time? Luno want, want Malaysia? And, <laughs> so I guess from, yeah, from yeah. the board, right? Yeah. What do yeah. they want the market to look like in three years' time? Yeah. I think we we want, as, as a company, I'm going to answer this question two ways. As a company, we definitely want to offer a very, very deep experience into the world of digital assets. Uh, we are still very investment focused. So, you know, we're offering uh, solutions for people to basically grow and, 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 and store their wealth. So that would be access to more crypto assets, more digital assets. That would be hopefully access to more um, 
what you call it, passive yielding solutions, for example, staking solutions and so on. So that would be the, the company view. Lah. In terms of what I would wish for the country or you know throughout Asia, right, is for a growing acceptance that uh, digital assets, crypto is here to stay. So actually, I think governments should be you know promoting the, the, the sensible and regular use instead of like, oh, let, let's pretend it doesn't exist. You know, how can we use this to, to actually help grow our economies and so on? Yeah. So I think that would be my, my ultimate wish lah for, yeah. for the legitimization, you know, not just in uh, investment use cases, but, you know, for, for the financial industry to work closely together with digital asset companies such as ours. Yeah, that was fantastic, man. You've answered yeah. a lot of my questions. Actually, it's, it's a very... It's, some of these questions are really personal because I, I want to know also, right? And who better than you to ask? I know? mean, this has been... Uh, yeah, interesting questions because yeah, a lot of tough questions as well. Yeah, no <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot, man. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Thanks, 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 thanks. <laughs>